David, you're not indicated as muted, but you appear to be muted. Is that a different kind of muting that you're using? Uh, my mic is muted, yes, I'm manually muted. Okay, I see, because it just doesn't show up on the screen that way. Thank you.
Well, it's six o'clock. We should probably start get started. That's not it. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is John Miller. I'm here on behalf of Watson and Associates, a small team that you'll get to know this evening. Um, thank you for joining us on this uh, webinar and uh, being able to interact with this webinar as well uh, this evening. It'll run from uh, six until seven o'clock. And um, basically what we're here to do is we're here to talk about and uh, to explore the topic of the council composition. Um, what is it and how can I help uh, inform the development of a council that we can all um, make use of? So, so that's the topic of the day is council composition. All right. So uh, I can't emphasize this enough and I'm going to keep on repeating it all evening is uh, that we're looking for your ideas, your wisdom, your insights, your whys, not just your what's. Um, so, some of you may be logged in on WebEx, in which case, as we go through the evening, if you've got questions or comments, you just put them straight into the chat and we'll be harvesting them throughout the evening. Uh, if you're uh, watching on Facebook.com uh, slash City of Guelph on their Facebook page, well, there's a, obviously a chat function in Facebook, so add your questions there. Um, and uh, your comments. Uh, if you're uh, watching the live stream on the guelph.ca slash live page, you won't be able to add your comments directly there. Same with people who have phoned in, uh, you'll be able to hear, but you won't be able to see, and it'll be really hard for you to add your comments. So it's really important that, um, that uh, we provide you with some additional ways of um, providing your input, right? Um, <clears throat> And the most important place for you to navigate to sometime in the next week or so is a page called haveyoursay.guelph.ca. And when you get there, you'll see a couple of options. And one of the options is council composition. And if you click on that, then you will be into a, an engagement place where you can ask more questions, get answers, read some background documents and information that covers, that overlaps a lot of what you're going to hear today. Um, and most importantly, again, there's a survey tool there where uh, these questions that are being posed tonight and framed up for you tonight will be open there for you to answer and to explain and elaborate a little bit further. It's not just an open and shut thing, but it's a place to have a bit more of a discussion almost. Uh, so that's the most important page for you to get to. The in, Tonight, the purpose really is to learn enough about this project to be able to provide deep insight and, and focused, really. Um, and you're, you're giving it to the people that are on this line and the people who are listening. There's actually on that uh, Have Your Say uh, website, there's um, contact information as well under a heading called Who's Listening, right? So uh, all of your input will be gathered and it will uh, come out in the form of a report um, that will be formulated to council in October for their consideration in, in November. And um, your wisdom and insight here um, at this stage of the larger project um, informs thinking about ward changes uh, or recommendations around the ward boundaries, okay? So, and there'll be another round of consultations around the ward boundaries in early 2021. So this is more just an education so that you can be as involved as possible. Okay. The agenda tonight, pretty straightforward in a way. Uh, we're getting started. Uh, I'll invite uh, Stephen O'Brien to provide an official welcome from the city. Um, and uh, then we'll hand it over to the consulting team, uh, David Siegel, Robert Williams, um, and they'll be uh, describing the scope of this project, what's in scope, what's out of scope, and then back straight into the big questions around the size of council. Should you have ward elections or at large elections? Should you have one council? Should you have more than one council per ward? Should they be full time or part in the way you're thinking about them? And 
at every step of the way, we'll just take a little pause and we'll remind you, put your questions down, right? Put your questions in the chat on Facebook or on WebEx, and uh, we'll be keeping track of those throughout the evening and harvesting them up. And then at the end of the evening, um, at about quarter to seven, we'll take a look at all these questions and start pulling them out on the table and getting uh, David and Robert to answer them for you. Uh, anything that we don't answer will be back on that haveyoursay.guelph.ca um, engagement site. So we'll try to address all of your questions as best we can. Now, this evening, um, when we have these big questions, uh, uh, our, uh, David and Robert will be providing all of that context that you might need around these questions. And then we pause and we think, hmm, what questions does it raise for me? What ideas do I have? You write them down. And then we move on to the next presentation. We're not actually going to be dealing with questions as we go along, okay? We're gonna be collecting questions as we go along but we're gonna keep moving through the presentation so that we have time at the end to deal with all these questions, okay? Um, and like I said before, anything that doesn't get answered, you'll find it on the haveyoursay.guelph.ca website, okay? Um, there's, if you're engaged on WebEx, it'll look different depending on what kind of device you're using, but uh, uh, you're probably seeing my face and some slides and a couple of other faces across the top of your screen. But if there's a little button down at the bottom for the chat, if you open that up and you put your questions in there, they don't go out to everybody. They only go to people who are eagerly waiting your input and uh, are going to be copying and pasting that into um, a document that we can re uh, report from, okay? Um, mind you, this whole consultation is not just this evening, it's open until September 4th. So tell your neighbor, tell your friends, get everybody involved that you can. Um, you can send an email to the clerk's office at clerks at guelph.ca. You can even send them an old fashioned letter if you want to City Hall. You can phone them at uh, uh, the number on the screen, 519-837-5603. So any form of input is welcome, okay? The most important thing is to have your say.guelph.ca, that website, and then the, the sub part is the council composition. Um, do your survey, ask more questions, read the background research. Um, and if you want to just keep your eye on the project, there's a, a page on, on the main site, the guelph.ca site slash council. And on that page, there's a whole bunch of uh, um, basic resources, including pointers to all of these resources here. So there's lots of ways and lots of time for you to continue to have input. All right. Now, some guidelines for this evening. Uh, I like to think that our, any, any kind of a conversation is going to be driven by some assumptions and some values that we hold. And these are the ones that uh, we hold and are gonna try and uphold for the evening. And that is that we really do believe that everyone has wisdom and that we need everyone's wisdom for the wisest results, right? The people listening in are citizens of Guelph and you've got on the ground experience and that's what we need. Um, doesn't mean that your every idea will be implemented. It means that it has to form part of that bigger picture. Uh, so that, that principle of the whole being greater than just the sum of its parts um, means that uh, everybody has a piece of the puzzle. So share it. Even if you're a little bit bashful and say, I only have half an idea, get it out there. And, we'll, and uh, it might be that half an idea that, that influences uh, our thinking. Uh, another principle is that there's no wrong answers. Back, just set aside rightness and wrongness and get your ideas out there. If you've got questions, um, there's no dumb questions because chances are, if you're thinking of a question, you don't have to be shy. Chances are somebody else is thinking about it too. Um, it's important to understand that, uh, you know, disrespectful or rude comments, we, we can't even share them, right? So keep it clean, keep it respectful, and that way we can actually respond to it, okay? Move along. So let me introduce your panelists this evening. Uh, I'm gonna start with me because I'm talking right now. Uh, I'm a facilitator, uh, certified and all that. I've been in practice uh, for 25, well, since 1992, really. 
Uh, most of my work, as you can tell by the picture, is uh, live, in-person stuff, and, and of course, now we're working all online. Um, so I design and I lead participatory uh, group processes, and I'm working with uh, Watson and Associates on, on this uh, larger engagement around more boundaries and council composition. Um, the two main panelists this evening um, hired to do the heavy lifting on this project are uh, Robert Williams. He's a public affairs consultant. He's retired from uh, a career at the University of Waterloo as a professor of uh, political science. Um, but he's been consulting with Watson and Associates and independently on a lot of uh, ward boundary reviews and council comp composition studies, okay? He's done a lot of work in this area since 2008, and it was his area of expertise as a professor as well. Um, our other expert is David Siegel, um, also a uh, re retired professor of political science, this time from Brock University. Um, <clears throat> he's the founding director of the Niagara Community Observatory, but he's also the author or co-author of many, many books and, and publications in the field of uh, municipal uh, government and administration, public administration. So he's bringing all of this background uh, as well. So you're, you're in good hands when it comes to the kind of research that has to be done in order to produce these reports. Um, and finally, I wanna introduce our host, uh, Stephen O'Brien. He's actually with the city and he's a general manager of the city clerk's office. Um, typically you would say, oh, he's city clerks, okay. Uh, he's been working in the municipal sector for 12 years, six of that, half of that with the city of Guelph. So he knows it really well. Uh, he worked in, an, in a range of other municipalities, regional municipalities, small rural municipalities, quite the range. And he's got a lot of interest in, in some of the modern concerns that municipalities are wrapping their heads around, like digital government, privacy, transparency, transformation of government services. Um, so he's... Um, the one who's responsible for this uh, overall project um, and that the Watson team is in the end gonna bring our report to. Um, and uh, so I think that brings my con the context setting to an end and I'm gonna hand it over to Stephen to uh, give us a, a formal introduction. All right, thank you. Great, thanks so much, John. Um, really uh, a distinct pleasure to be here and, and thank you to all the residents of Guelph that have connected in, whether that be on Facebook Live, on guelph.ca slash live, um, with us on WebEx, uh, whether you're phoning in, uh, we're really quite uh, pleased to have everyone join in. I can't um, impress upon folks how an important uh, a body of work this is um, for not only the staff in, in, in the city, but also I think for the community uh, writ large. And so uh, we're just very, very excited that everyone can uh, can be here to participate. I can't encourage everyone enough to um, get in, uh, submit comments in the in the chat feature on WebEx, submit comments through Facebook. However, you're connecting tonight, even if it's an email to clerks at guelph.ca, please do connect in uh, and share your thoughts as we move through this evening. And obviously, as John alluded to, as we continue on through the engagement process, um, this is a, a very important uh, uh, part of our, of our work and and on our work plan this year. And I know that council is uh, is awaiting this uh, this feedback and engagement from the community as well. So with that, what I'd actually like to do now is uh, important for us to do whenever we meet and gather, even if it is digitally, uh, is to um, make a territorial acknowledgement. And so I will say that as we gather, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nation, Inuit and Métis people today. As a city, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work. Today, we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabek peoples on whose traditional territory we are meeting. I'd also like to bring greetings from uh, Mayor Guthrie and members of council. Uh, this was actually discussed last night at uh, city council and, and the mayor made a, made a public announcement about uh, this engagement this evening and the, and the continuation of this engagement over the next couple of weeks. Um, and so I, I want to bring greetings from, from uh, the mayor and members of council. And, and I, I think I can say uh, on their behalf that they also uh, are keenly aware of the importance of this project. And so I'm happy to bring that forward. With that, I will turn it over to um, our consultant team and they can walk us through the scope of the project. Thank you, Stephen. My name is Robert Williams uh, and I'm partnering with Watson and Associates 
a consulting firm uh, that has re been retained by the city of Guelph to conduct this project, formally entitled Council Composition and Ward Boundary Review. And the team responsible for the project also is David Stegall and ICA Associates, and you've met John Miller as part of that, who are managing the public engagement component of the review. Uh, as John mentioned earlier, before I started working with Watson and Associates, I was a faculty member at the University of Waterloo for 35 years plus. Uh, I've been working with Watson for about 10 years now on more than a dozen ward boundary reviews, and I'm excited to bring that expertise and the expertise of this entire team to this project in Guelph. I have with me here tonight David Siegel, who is recently retired uh, as a professor of political science from Brock University and is also involved in the project. Hi, David. Involved in this project um, because Guelph has some very important decisions to make. The current electoral system has been in place since the 1991 election, which is uh, almost 30 years. So it's not surprising that uh, council has decided that it's now time to have a review uh, of this uh, before the next municipal election in October 2022. And so this is where Robert and I come on the scene. So we're currently in phase one of this project, uh, which is focusing on council composition and employment status. There are uh, a number of key questions, five in particular, that we're gonna walk through tonight that are part of that component of the review. How many city councilors should there be? How many per ward? Should they be elected in wards at all? And if so, how many wards? And finally, whether they should be uh, play the role uh, in a full-time or part-time basis. That's the employment status part of that. Once that component has been uh, resolved by council, which we hope will happen in November, we will then embark on phase two of the review starting uh, at the end of the year and into early next year, where we will review the boundaries of the wards that will be used to elect the next city council in Guelph. Now, there is another process that uh, will follow from that, and this will be led by city staff. Uh, this will involve whether to modify the system of election in Guelph to allow for what's called a ranked ballot uh, that uh, would be used for the election of mayor and council, and another review that would determine the actual level of compensation for members of council. Started phase one in December 2019, and we plan to have a series of town halls in March and April of 2020 before the COVID pandemic uh, intervened. We've now adjusted both the method of public engagement and the timing. So we're now having this uh, virtual uh, public engagement. Um, and there's a variety of other ways of explaining, of getting involved, as John Miller uh, mentioned earlier. A key component is the survey that's available and will be available until September 4th, 2020. We at Watson will be sending a report to council in time for its November 5th, uh, 2020 uh, meeting. That's a little bit later than we had planned uh, when we started this project but it's still plenty of time to uh, move on the other phases so that everything will be ready in time for the municipal election in October, 2020. Sorry, 2022. <laughs> now, before we actually start discussing some of the changes that could be made in the current electoral system in Guelph, we should review the key uh, features of the existing system. Uh, Guelph's uh, council consists of 13 members. That is a mayor who is elected at large, that is across the whole city, 12 city councillors who are elected in six wards, which therefore means two councillors per ward. You're going to hear about this a number of times this evening, but that's the basic structure that we start with. Now, the mayor is elected at large, as I said, meaning that every qualified elector gets to cast a vote. The, can the mayor is uh, determined to be the candidate who wins the most votes in the election, even if that is not a majority of the votes cast. This system is set out in the Ontario Municipal Act and has been that way for many, many years. Municipalities have limited uh, opportunity to change that arrangement. However, 
in 2018, a modification to the act was passed, which would allow municipalities to determine to use an alternative method, what is called a ranked ballot, where the candidates are marked, uh, however many there are, first pre preference, second preference, and so forth. And those ballots are redistributed uh, to candidates based on those markings until one of the candidates has been the preferred choice of a majority of the of the votes cast, that is 50%. That would be a fairly important change in practice. And as we've suggested a moment ago, staff will be initiating a review of that process once we determine uh, the first phase of the review in time to qualify for uh, that change in the next election. So phase one will not talk about this change in the way councillors are elected, and, and uh, we will concentrate on determining how many of them are, there are. The city of Guelph is currently divided into six wards, as you can see on this map. Each ward elects two councillors, which means that each voter has two votes, um, and the two uh, highest vote getters among the uh, candidates are declared elected as councillors in that ward. Um, the next graphic that we'll look at shows the permanent population in the wards. And what you can see there is that Ward 6 in particular has considerably more, considerably larger population than the other wards. And that also is the ward that where that's experiencing the greatest growth right now. So what that means is that um, the there is an imbalance in the wards um, and something needs to be done with the board boundaries between now and the 2022 election or the imbalance that you see on this graph will become even larger. Make that change to change the number of wards and the number of councillors. And that's a key part of this phase one of the review. For example, uh, the six wards uh, could be changed to elect one uh, member per ward. The overall number could change and a number of other uh, modifications are there. So we're going to turn to those alternatives uh, after John uh, Miller uh, makes a quick comment about how you can participate in the uh, review. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, David. Um, it's really important that as we go through this evening, if the people who are listening, if, if questions pop into your mind at any point, just put them in the chat, okay? So that we can collect them as we go along. Don't wait to the end because by then you might forget, <laughs> okay? So put them in the chat, either in WebEx or in Facebook um, and uh, we'll, we'll catch it later. That's it. So, so why don't we turn our attention to the size of council? Those questions now, please. Right. Yeah. And and uh, there are really three key questions that are uh, we want to address in this review, and they're they're listed there on the screen. How many councillors should the city of Guelph Council have? How many councillors should be elected from each ward? How many wards should the city be divided into? Many of you will realize that if you answer two of these questions, the third one is pretty well determined. But they are separate questions that we need to to address uh, about uh, how the council is going to be composed in the future. Well, let's start with the first question about the number of councillors. In fact, if uh, Guelph decided to go with an at-large system, this would be the only question that uh, we need to address. Within very broad limits, council has the authority to decide on the number of councillors. The Ontario Municipal Act says that there must be a minimum of four councillors, but the Act does not specify any maximum. Beyond that specified minimum, there's no real um, uh, principle or standard or formula that uh, determines the appropriate size of a municipal council. It's something of a balancing act. Figuring out how many councillors you want is something of a balancing act. If you have a large number of councillors, <clears throat> that increases the ability of residents to have access to their local councillor. It also means that uh, council will be large enough to represent the diversity of the community in terms of things like neighborhood, gender, ethnicity, and, and so forth. 
However, when a council gets too large, it can slow down and complicate the decision making process if every councillor needs to uh, participate on uh, every item that comes before council. A larger council also increases the cost of council, although the total cost of council compensation is a pretty small percent of the total budget. The next table that we're, we look at um, shows the number of councillors that Guelph and some comparable municipalities uh, have. Guelph's 12 councillors make it quite similar to the other comparable municipalities. It also suggests, this table also suggests that if Guelph decided to either increase or decrease the number of councillors that it has, uh, it's still going to be within this uh, comfortable range. Since we don't have any real rational scientific guidance about how to determine the ideal number of counselors, one thing that we could do is begin with our current number of 12 and ask ourselves a couple questions around that number. Is that number 12 so large that it complicates the council decision-making process? Or we could ask a question in the opposite way. Is the number so small that it limits the ability of council to represent the demographic diversity found within the city. This is what I mean by the balancing act. The answer to those two questions will guide us to the idea of, do we think 12 is fine? Or would we like to have a smaller or a larger number of uh, uh, councilors? So, so the question, sorry, sorry, John. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. So the, what, one of the questions that we need, uh, some solid input from a lot of people in is what makes sense for the city of Guelph? How many councillors should serve on the city of Guelph's council? Um, the best place to put that is at the have your say site. Um, but if you have questions about, in particular, if you have questions about size of council, now's the best time to put it in the chat so that uh, we can deal with it at the end and then you're really clear about what the implications might be. Okay, let's keep moving. So the second question we mentioned was the, the, no, the number of councillors per ward. Now, ever since the ward system was established in Guelph, it, it has been a council of 12 members elected in two member wards. That's what everyone in Guelph understands as the way to do it. But there are other ways to do this. And if we look at that comparable comparison chart a moment ago, you'll see that a great many uh, uh, municipalities use a different number. Uh, many of them have only one member per ward, which if again, related to that, if it's a bigger council, there would be more wards. Uh, Guelph is, is uh, an exception in here among the, that first uh, group on the table. Uh, but there are other variations, as you can see, Chatham Kent uh, with a, a system with uh, wards of different sizes uh, that uh, uh, are, is not very often found across Ontario. And that's typically because uh, as in the case of Chatham Kent, it's a municipality that was created by an amalgamation. And the system uh, was built upon recognizing those historical circumstances. This is not a system though that is pretty very straightforward and it's often unfair. Some people get to elect three members of council, others only get to elect one. Uh, and, and these are not factors that necessarily would be an improvement in, in Guelph's situation. Uh, so in a two member system though, there are questions that, that uh, need to be asked. We're not saying it's the right one or the wrong one. The, the system has its own features. A two member system is more likely uh, is, is more likely one in which a constituent has um, has been able to get, as we put it, the ear of the councillor. At least one councillor is likely to be available uh, in a two-member system, uh, and maybe the other one is is uh, uh, unreachable. There's also a chance, uh, and it does happen in the political world, that not everyone agrees with you. So it may be that if there are two councillors, it increases the chance that the resident will find someone who, who uh, would find their their uh, perspective, one that they can sympathize with. With, On the other side, of course, it's one of the factors that in contributes to a larger council. 
two-member wards also increase the size of wards. If we saw in that map, uh, Guelph is cut into six parts. It's a big city to be in only six parts. So that is, is one of the negatives. And of course, what often happens too is if you do have two counselors as a citizen and you approach both of them, it could very well be that they both take these matters up with staff, which means we have duplication of activity. And if the question's asked differently, we may get some kind of confusion as to which is the, the right answer. So again, it, it's not a system that's straightforward, yes or no, but it's a question that uh, residents of Guelph need to uh, think about. So once again, um, if you could just pause for a second and all the people who are listening and viewing, if you could make note of any questions that you have around how many counselors should be elected from each ward and write those in the chat, either here in WebEx or on Facebook. And if you have some ideas and suggestions, the best place for that is at have, haveyoursay.guelph.ca. Okay. Let, let's uh, take a look at the next question, if we could, please. Who's addressing the question of uh, changing the number of wards? Okay. Okay. Um, the third question has to do with the number of wards. And once you've determined the number of counselors and the number of counselors per ward, you've really determined the number of wards, but it's worthwhile at this point to look at the result of that and decide whether you're satisfied with the number of wards that you've uh, created. Now, phase two will look at the specific size and shapes of the wards. What we're doing in this phase one is just addressing this in a broad way, looking at the size of the city of Guelph um, and determining how many wards would be ideal. Um, and this is a matter of balance, just like I was talking earlier about the number of uh, counselors. There's no ideal solution here. If you have a small number of relatively large wards, then it could be difficult for counselors to have easy access to, it could be difficult for residents, I should say, to have difficult, uh, be difficult for them to have easy access to their counselors. And it also increases the diversity in the ward, which can make it difficult for the counselor to represent that ward well. On the other hand, if you have a larger number of small wards, it makes citizen access easier and it increases the ability of counselors to represent that ward, and that's good, but a larger number of wards will also increase the size of council, which adds to the complication and uh, uh, the time-consuming nature of some council discussions. The table that we looked at earlier indicated that most comparable other municipalities use either 10 or 12 wards. So Guelph with six has somewhat fewer wards than uh, the other comparable municipalities. We could follow the same line of reasoning here that we did with the number of councilors and think about how well has this six ward system functioned in Guelph for the last almost 30 years. Um, if we think that um, the wards are too large uh, because they're too diverse and they don't have proper representation, then we probably would uh, like to have a larger number of wards. If you feel that they're too small and they make the council too large, then you'd want to have a smaller number of wards. So this is, uh, you'd want to have smaller wards. So this is the um, th get, this is the third question in this group that we were talking about. So so once again, this is that other aspect of that these intertwined questions. Maybe this is the one that drives your thoughts. I don't know. How many wards should the city of Guelph be divided into? That's a big question. So if you're not clear about anything, any aspect of that, then uh, put your question in the chat on WebEx or in Facebook. And uh, if you've got some ideas about how many wards the city needs to be divided into, you put it in the haveyoursay.guelph.ca uh, web 
site where it says council composition. You got to pick the right one. Um, but it, it, and it, again, it's a balancing act. So what makes the most sense for Guelph? That's the really big question. What makes the most sense for Guelph? So the last question that deals with the election system itself is whether Guelph should use an at-large electoral system or a system of wards to elect its councillors. Uh, any old timers uh, on, on the uh, the uh, call tonight uh, would know that from 1909 through to 1987, uh, councillors in Guelph, and at one time there were as many as 18 of them, were elected by general vote. They, that is, they were elected at large. So it's only been since 1988 uh, that Guelph has elected its councillors in the six wards that we've been talking about uh, uh, along the way. And in fact, back in 2006, Guelph electors in, endorsed keeping that system. But in 2020, uh, council has decided that it would like to consult with the public about whether this system should be changed. Now, in an at-large system, there are no geographic divisions within the municipality. All candidates run across the entire municipality, and voters choose candidates who will represent the entire municipality. So if it were an at-large system and 12 councillors, everyone would get to vote for 12 candidates or whatever the number might be. So you choose from all of the candidates uh, and, and make your rec compose your council out of that pool of talent. Now, uh, the uh, practice of using an at-large election in Ontario is most common in smaller municipalities, often rural municipalities that don't really have significant size to deal with or geographic differences within the municipality. Uh, the largest municip municipality in Ontario with an at-large system is actually the city of Niagara Falls with a population of 85,000 people. Vancouver, with a population of over 600,000, also has an at-large system, but it, it runs its council on a party system. So candidates are, are not simply one big pool. Voters are, are making their choice among teams of candidates. That's not the case here in Guelph. Both of those cities have had periodic discussions about switching to a ward system. The alternative to the at-large election is the ward system. Um, which is the system that Guelph has used since the 1991 election. In this system, the city is divided into geographic areas referred to as wards, and candidates choose which ward they want to run in, and the electors in each ward vote for the candidate to run in that ward. Most medium and large municipalities, particularly those that have natural divisions, such as different types of residential areas or maybe areas with different historical uh, backgrounds, um, choose to have the ward system of election. Which compares the, the two, uh, the two uh, approaches. Uh, for example, voters are able to select candidates they think will do the best job rather than having to make a choice among candidates who happen to run in their own ward. In an at-large system, it encourages candidates to focus on citywide issues rather than simply uh, basing their campaign on the ward issues, which, as we put it here, can lead to turf protection. My ward is the priority, the city is secondary. An at-large system turns it around the other way. The city is more important than the neighborhood. In an at-large system, uh, there is also uh, some issues about about who would be approached uh, for assistance in the uh, uh, in the event that you have a question or, or a matter to uh, to raise. Uh, I agree that an excessive focus on neighborhood issues and turf protection to the exclusion of citywide issues could lead to turf protection sorts of issues. But I think it's also important to have someone whose job it is to stand up for my particular neighborhood. In fact, in an at-large system, I'm not even sure which of those large number of counselors I should go to when I have a neighborhood issue. What if none of the at-large counselors who are elected come from my neighborhood? Then, then what do I do? The other concern that I have about an at-large system is that 
uh, it's going to be quite expensive for candidates to run across the entire municipality. And that means that good candidates uh, might choose not to run, or might not be able to run, because they simply won't be able to raise enough money to uh, afford to run across the entire municipality. Occasionally, uh, municipalities can combine uh, an at-large and award system, but this is relatively rare in a single-tier municipality like Guelph. And the problem is, with a hybrid system of that kind, it, it creates an awkward relationship between the two types of councillors. All councillors at the table are supposed to be equal. But when councillors are elected from different electoral bases, does this mean that some of them are seen to be more important than others or more equal than others? So a key decision that will come out of the phase one of this review is whether city councillors in Guelph will continue to be elected in wards or whether they'll sit, the city would revert to the at-large system that it used for a good part of the 20th century. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this is another opportunity, a little reminder uh, to folks is that if you have questions about this notion of ward system versus an at-large system, now's a really good time to put them in the chat, either on Facebook or on this WebEx call. And if you have opinions and insights that you want to be absorbed into this consideration, uh, then make sure you go to haveyoursay.guelph.ca slash council, compos uh, council hyphen composition. And in there's a, a survey where you can share some of your ideas and the reasons why you think it's a good idea, uh, one, whatever your idea is, why you think it is a good idea. Um, so just for a second, any questions about the use of at-large or award system to elect councillors in Guelph? You got questions? Type in. If not, let's keep moving on. We're going to change okay, gears you, here a little bit. Thank you, John. The last question on the agenda this evening, the last of the big five, should councillors in the city of Guelph be considered full-time or be and be paid accordingly? Now, there's a perception that the, the workload of councillors has been steadily increasing uh, as the complexity of government activity has grown. And there are challenges to performing that role for part-time counselors. Residents also have increasing expectations of their counselors to be available for various reasons in the course of, of, of the year. So this can lead uh, to many counselors devoting more time uh, than they have in the past. Now the act doesn't make a distinction. Uh, the Municipal Act doesn't make a distinction between full-time and part-time counselors. A counselor is a counselor and each one has the same powers and duties, regardless of the amount of time they spend on the job. Uh, and the difference then is, is in the terms of this discussion, is what the expectations of the residents of Guelph are for their counselors and whether there would be a, an adjustment in how much they are paid to play that role. Now, we have also done some research on this across Ontario and have another table here, which shows the, the way uh, councillors are compensated in uh, a number of uh, single tier municipalities in Ontario. This table shows us that in fact, only three cities uh, are councillors considered to be in full time, a uh, full time role, Toronto, Ottawa, and Hamilton. In some regions, and, and there are exceptions to this chart, where councillors serve on a local uh, municipal council, but also on a regional council, each one of them treats it as a, a part-time activity. When you put the two of them together, it becomes uh, close to a full-time employment, but that's not what we're com looking at here. We're looking at municipalities that are like Guelph and in the same, uh, certainly in the, the area from London down are, are uh, roughly similar in, in population. So if, if uh, councillors in, Guel in Guelph were to be considered full-time, this would, would be a, a fairly important change. And Guelph would in fact be the smallest municipality on this list uh, by some considerable difference if it were to compensate its councillors at a full-time rate. Part. 
the next uh, table shows the results of a survey that was conducted as a part of this review. It indicates that the current Guelph counselors estimate that they spend an average of about 20 hours per week on council business. However, that average disguises the fact that there are significant variations over the years, uh, over the year caused by things like budget time is very uh, busy. Uh, there can be periodic crises that take up more than that 20 hours. Um, so 20 hours is more than one thinks of as typical full-time employment. But that 20 hours uses up so much time from a counselor and it's unpredictable. Um, what that means is it's very difficult for a counselor to get some sort of supplementary full-time employment or even to find a regular fixed schedule part-time job. The opportunity to serve on council should be open to anyone who meets the qualifications of citizenship, residence, and, and age. On the current Guelph Council, several councils are retired or they're entrepreneurs or they have freelance employment that allows them to set their own hours. There are only two councillors who have uh, full-time employment. Guelph councillors might have arrived at the awkward position where their workload as a councillor is not really full-time in terms of the hours involved, but it is so time-consuming and unpredictable, that's a very important factor in this, that it restricts the ability of counselors to pursue supplementary conventional nine to five type uh, employment. Now the idea of moving from part-time to full-time counselors does not necessarily involve a large increase in expenditures. We've again prepared a slide which, which inv involves a little bit of that information. This, of course, is going to be dependent on earlier questions. How many counselors are there? Uh, but it shows that some possible costs associated with that. If, for sake of argument, uh, the compensation for each counselor were increased from approximately 40,000 to 80,000, and the number of counselors remained the same, which is necessarily the case, if it did, this would involve an increase of about $584,000, uh, which really is a very tiny fraction of the overall budget of the of the city. If if the compensation were doubled and the number of counselors reduced, it really wouldn't amount to a big increase either. And the only adjustment would have to do with benefits. Now there are other factors that would come into this in terms of creating office space for counselors. If if they are working full from City Hall, presumably space would be needed. And there would probably also be some administrative costs for those counselors. But overall, uh, the, the cost factor is, is surprisingly um, modest in terms of the overall budget of, of the city. Uh, and we should also note in passing, of course, that, that the actual rate of salary, we're picking a, a kind of, for the sake of argument, number. That's a separate process that will come in the new year. Uh, so uh, currently, then, we're, we're asking uh, to think about whether uh, a, a, a change in the role of counselors should be undertaken for the city of Guelph. Now, there'll be hesitation on the part of many residents about accepting the idea of full-time counselors, but residents need to decide if they want to continue the status quo, which, as Dave suggested, forces people to make sacrifices to become a counselor and likely restricts the type of people who will make themselves available to run for office. Or on the other hand, whether they want to compensate counselors at a full-time wage so that they can concentrate primarily on their council responsibilities. Cool, thank you, Bob and Dave. So, so the big, th this is a tricky question and it's kind of a philosophical question really is, um, do you want full? Do you think uh, the city needs full time or part time counselors? And as you can imagine, they're interwoven with your other question, other ideas too. So, uh, if you have questions about full time versus part time, now's the best time to put it in the chat, either on WebEx or on Facebook. Any questions about um, full time or part time counselors? Pause. 
put them in there. Okay, and if you have any comments or opinions, then you go to the have your say dot guelph dot ca slash council hyphen composition uh, engagement platform there. There's a whole bunch of ways to engage. There's lots of information there, but there's a survey where you can put your ideas. Now, there's more than just four or five questions there because we want to understand the why, not just the what of your opinion. Okay. So now we're moving into uh, the uh, uh, an interesting part of the evening where we get to uh, grab questions as they've been coming in on Facebook and on uh, this WebEx uh, call. And I'll, I'll just be going through some of them and putting some uh, a kind of range of questions to uh, Bob and Dave and perhaps sometimes uh, Stephen, if it's if it's kind of out of scope of uh, the and it's a bit more administrative and Stephen might want to uh, chime in on this. Um, but we've got lots of questions that we've uh, gathered up here and. Um, Huh, the good, good ones too. Uh, so a quick question. Um, David, how long has Guelph had 12 part time counselors? Can you remind us that? How long have we had 12 part time counselors? Any well, I th I'm pretty sure that would be the 1991 election. Yeah. Um, prior to that, uh, there was in that it was at large, wasn't it? But yeah, so it goes to the, it's thirty years, um, thirty one years by the time we have the uh, the next election. So it's something that uh, people are quite familiar with, obviously in the city. If I can jump in on there quickly, John, I think the tradition has always been that municipal officials are part time. So we, we, the number 12 really dates from that time, but but for as long as we've had municipal governments, councillors in smaller places have always been considered doing a service to their community. Getting paid was was a kind of um, a bonus. It wasn't it wasn't a, a job in the same in the same way. So the idea that councillors are still part time here in Guelph and across every municipality except for three is part of a very long tradition in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Um, do you have any uh, figures, even ballpark, on what's the average number of councillors per capita in a city of comparable size? Sort of councillors per capita. Any well, that we saw when we were talking about this, um, showed uh, cities that were comparable to wealth in size. So that um, it, it, the answer to that is that the other cities are going to be just about the same as uh, uh, as Guelph. I, I don't have my calculator here that I can do that sort of calculation, um, but they're going to be about the same. Those that we deliberately looked and for in that table at other municipalities, at single tier municipalities that are in the one hundred thousand to two hundred thousand population range. Um, so they're, they're going to be quite comparable. Um, it would be easy enough to do that uh, calculation, but I, I, I don't have the ability to do it right now. <laughs> it, it's worth pointing out that uh, on the Have Your Say website are some background documents. So there's a whole bunch more research than we can cover in these presentations, if I'm not correct. And, and I'll also jump in too to reinforce what something David said earlier when we were walking through that. There is no set of uh, expectations from the province or elsewhere. Every decision is local. How many are we comfortable with? And that's what we see even in that short list uh, where the number is locally driven uh, and it's not comparable. It can't say, well, because Guelph has 12 councillors and, and Hamilton's got 15, well, Guelph is half the size of, size of Hamilton, so it should, it should double it. I don't, it doesn't really work that way. It's to do with your local circumstances. Some might say Hamilton's council's too small. Others will say uh, Guelph's too big. It's it's not something easily transferable. And this is why it's what the community itself believes is appropriate for its circumstances. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. So um, question of clarification here. I found this one kind of public adminish, uh, what other elements of city life are based on ward boundaries? 
So um, if you change the, the ward boundaries or the number of wards, the configuration of the wards, does it affect the distribution of services directly? I'm getting the uh, the proverbial nod from uh, <laughs> from our consultant team, so I can answer that. I mean, from a, from a city service delivery standpoint, um, really the wards are about um, about you know representation uh, by elected people. Um, what I will say though is is if you strip away the service side, is and 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 um, Dr. Williams and Dr. Siegel alluded to this. Um, sometimes those wards, depending on the size and scale of them, can actually uh, impact sort of civic life in a unique way because they can be very much aligned with sort of traditionally defined neighborhoods or communities with within the city. And so, you know, sometimes they sort of have a uh, not necessarily a direct linkage to city services, but they have a have a deep connection to the community and the communities within the city. So it's more about expression. Yeah. So um, another, this is a good question, and I'm not sure that uh, either Bob or Dave will be able to answer it. Um, what does the research show about the number of women and minorities elected in at large versus ward systems? Because there seems to be a fairly large concern if we look at the uh, feedback we've had so far online uh, with diversity and uh, inclusion, right? So is there any research that shows that one model is better at teasing out that diversity than another? Good question. Any sense of that? Oh, there is no research that would demonstrate that if it, that would be a topic that would require a fair bit of, of uh, uh, effort to collect uh, for a start. And, and the, the composition of a council related to those kinds of, of factors would, again, be very largely driven by the nature of the political process in that community. Uh, I'm not sure that, that um, there, there's a definitive answer on that. It, it touches back on, though, on, on the, some of the points that David did raise. In, for example, an at-large system, individuals who are not well known, who may not have resources, who, who may not have, if you will, a high profile, uh, who, who may fall into those minority categories, would be at a distinct disadvantage. But there are always exceptions. There are always people who can cut through that and 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 make their mark in a community. So again, it's it's not something that we can we can pin down with any accuracy. It really uh, relates to the dynamics of the community itself and, and how well or how poorly those kinds of uh, interests are represented uh, around the council table after the election. John, maybe I can jump in there as well, just to add some some context. I'm aware of some research that's been done uh, at sort of the subnational and uh, national level by a researcher uh, at the University of Western Ontario named Kate Graham. And Kate was a uh, is a researcher that, that I think was featured on sort of a Canada 2020 podcast about actually uh, female first ministers. So um, it's it, I, I don't know, and I will defer to the, the, the research experts on, on the panel, but I, it feels like it's a it's a growing area of research. I would love to see it sort of spill down to the local level. But um, if there are those that are interested, I, I think there probably could be some comparison, um, maybe analogies drawn between uh, what drives, uh, in the case of gender, female uh, candidates to run for office as opposed to male candidates and those kind of things. But again, probably a, a little bit of a, a gap in the research from from what the what the uh, the consultant team has shared. Okay, cool. I have a, a question of clarification. Really, this is straightforward, but it's it's worth untangling here from someone by the name of Tanya. I don't understand how two counselors per ward leads to increased sizes of wards. How does that work? If you because you're, div why you're dividing you the city ward? into smaller chunks to elect six. You look at the map of Guelph, and if it's a 12-member council and it's two members for ward, you, you divide the city up into six parts. If, for sake of argument, it were a nine-member council and each ward elected one person, you would cut it up into smaller pieces. That sounds that sounds rather drastic, <laughs> but you would group neighborhoods to come up with nine parts. By definition, those parts are likely to be smaller. You take the city population and divide it by six, you get one number, you divide it by nine, you get a smaller number. That would be the kind of dynamic that a two-member ward, a two-member system would lead to, uh, again, with that finite number at, at the top. 
of 12. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a very broad question, kind of the opposite kind of a question. And I'm not quite sure who to put it to, but I, I think it's either Bob or Dave. Um, this it started out as more of a statement about the importance of values uh, and, and governing these kinds of conversations. So if I turn it into a question, um, what values or principles are guiding this review? That's a tricky one. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what Dave would contribute to that. I, I think at a, at a broad level, I would say that like, like many parts of the city's operation, it's important uh, at, at a certain point to step back and say, why are we doing it this way? Why is the structure this way? This applies in all manner of city services. You don't leave city services untouched for 30 years and say, oh, it was good enough then. We had a fire truck. We don't we don't need to replace it. We've got one uh, or whatever it is. I'm being a little facetious, but the point is uh, it's important to step back and look at your your democratic structure. And, and these uh, questions uh, came out of, of uh, perspectives that we know were around the council table. The issue of full time and part time has been around since 2012. Is this the right way to do it? And, and the issues that we talked about in terms of growing demands are there and, and it's important to step back and just say, you know, is there a better way to do it? And, and this is really what uh, leads us to this phase one to ask those questions. It may be that having looked at it all, council said, it's fine the way it is, don't change anything. Okay, but, but at least we've drawn that line and said, okay, we've evaluated it. We've, we've looked at some of the rationale for doing it this way and we've reached a conclusion. Okay. Now I realize we are at 702 and um, I don't, I've got a lot of questions, but there's a fair bit of duplication right now. Um, there was one question, I'm just looking for it, uh, that had to do with uh, future population and population projections are, um, so I'm, I'm not seeing it, but it has to do with, um, it's one thing to know what the population breakdown is today, and we had a chart for that. Uh, are we looking at, uh, how far out into the future are we looking in terms of population projections? Okay, I, I'm gonna let Dave pick up on what he was gonna suggest on the last one, and then I'll answer this. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to weigh in on the values. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that the sorts of values that the city of Guelph has brought to this, and I think uh, uh, the consultants also are governed by is, first of all, public engagement. I mean, we've gone to, we, we were ready to have the face-to-face the -face public meetings, and now we've, we've gone to considerable effort to uh, have a different kind of uh, public engagement. So I think the public involvement is certainly one of the uh, major uh, values that we bring to this. Transparency uh, is another. We've produced uh, the websites, the information for the website, and we're trying to be as transparent as we can about uh, uh, how we view these, these issues. Um, I think we've also been concerned about equity sorts of uh, issues because we've talked about uh, the need to have a council that's large enough to uh, reflect the demographic uh, characteristics of uh, the city of Guelph. And just off the top of my head, I think those are uh, quite a few of the significant values that are, are driving the exercise from, from our perspective. Thank you. So if, if to that previous question, John, uh, I am on, aren't I? Yes. You are on. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, that really is a phase two of, of the re report. As I suggested earlier, we may come out of phase one with council saying, let's just keep six wards and go from there. We may come out of it with some other number. But the second phase is a ward boundary review. So even if there are still only six wards, as we saw in the information provided, they are very badly balanced. There, there are some wards, a couple of wards are much larger than others. So a ward boundary review is appropriate. That review has a set of guiding principles that have been identified to guide it. And that does include the, the idea of, of future growth. As I like to suggest, you don't design a ward system that's out of date the day after you approve it. 
So you try to build in some uh, attention to where the growth is going to be. That's where the other part of this team comes in. Watson and Associates economists are, are, are the, the part of the team that will provide that information. That's the work that they do. Demographic work related to, to Guelph and other municipalities across Ontario, tracking where uh, residential growth is going to happen, the nature of that growth, other demographic factors that would allow us to project into the future. The timeline is three elections. Uh, that would be 22, 26, and 30. Uh, that's roughly the same cycle that's used for federal redistributions. House, seats in the House of Commons are reviewed after every census, i.e. 10 years. So this is a comparable exercise to think out what the city is going to look like in roughly 10 year, a 10 year interval based on the expertise of, of the other part of this team. They're not here tonight because <laughs> this is our part. They will be, and we will be in that next phase, but but they will be bringing up the uh, the empirical evidence to, to reinforce uh, ward boundaries, not only in 2021, but out uh, toward 2030. Cool. John, maybe before we sort of move to the final slide, if I can just add a little context to, um, if individuals are looking to get more information about uh, population projections, um, what Dr. Williams mentioned is absolutely spot on. Another thing to keep an eye on is is the shaping Guelph, which is Guelph's growth management strategy. And so there, the city will be engaging on that, asking feedback about where and how Guelph should grow. It's coming soon, and that that will actually be um, some of those projections will be determined by where and how we grow to a certain degree. And and as as Dr. Williams alluded to. Watson Associates is in lockstep with that to determine sort of and monitor and keep a tabs on those those projections. The other thing I would mention is in terms of values and, and sort of uh, the principles guiding this, uh, this body of work, I, I think it comes back to sort of the vision that, that, that the city's strategic plan sets out for the city, which is an inclusive, connected, prosperous city where, where we as Guelphites look after each other and our environment and some of the values that are underpinning that strategic plan, like inclusion, the fact that we're stronger because of our differences, um, in integrity and, and being honest and ethical and having nights like this where we can have open conversations and use the have your say .ca tool. Those are some of the values and 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 uh, um, principles that sort of are under guiding this uh, or underpinning, sorry, this uh, this body of work. I'll pull up the uh, the last couple of slides now, John. All right, thank you very much. Um, there, there's a few more questions out here that uh, I think are pretty straightforward and uh, are answered on the website for sure, and, and we will be reinforcing them. So here's just a reminder of the questions that you'll be asked and that we want your feedback on. And I hope you gather a sense that uh, these are not um, simple questions. They're not formulaic. They're not canned. Uh, the inquiry that we're making of you, uh, the people, the citizens of Guelph is um, truly open. And um, we as a consulting team, we're just dying to know why you think, uh, what you think about these questions of how many counselors should they be, how many per ward, should there be wards or should it be at, at large and how many wards? Um, and should we be approaching this, uh, uh, viewing the role of a counselor as a full-time job or a part-time job and paid accordingly? These big questions are in the survey that you would find. Um, and on the next slide, you've got the, uh, the link that you would find on um, haveyoursay.guelph.ca slash council hyphen composition. That's the most important place for you to go. You can read more background information. You should be able to find, see this uh, or, or replay this video if you wish. Um, you can add your insights. You can also see what questions other people have had and add your questions um, and direct your friends to this. You can share these links on your social media if you can. If you just want to keep your eye on things, then the guelph.ca slash council page has a lot of your essential pointers um, to where you can find everything that you need. Okay. Um, so uh, I thank you very much uh, for sticking with us for this uh, whole evening. We have run nine minutes over time. My apologies for that. It was my fault right at the very beginning because there's so much context to cover. So we're really looking forward to uh, hearing what you think, reading what you think. And I wanna say thank you very much for your patience and your insights that you share and these great questions too. 
wanted to say something? I was going to say, be ready for phase two. Ah, phase two. <laughs> we we want to hear you uh, when we get to that part too, as well. Yep. Be ready for the report that goes to council before even that happens. So we'll be coming back to you folks in uh, 2021 with maps and lines on maps and uh, uh, gathering your insights because only you, the citizens of Guelph, really have your finger on, on, on where we can draw these lines. So um, without any further ado, I think we're at the end. Um, so thank you very much, folks. Um, have yourself a pleasant evening and we look forward to hearing from you. And thank you very much, David and Robert. Thanks, and thanks everybody. And all the people behind the scenes as well. Thank you. We're no longer live. We're no longer live. <laughs>